More than 20 years ago now, uh, Catherine and I found ourselves on the other side of the world looking for a church to attend for the next few years. Uh, we'd visited one that had been recommended to us, but for a variety of reasons, we didn't feel that it was a place that we would be at home or be able to serve without reservation. So the next Sunday, we visited another. The senior minister of the church was preaching that Sunday. When he entered the pulpit, he encouraged us all to open our Bibles and prepare, he prepared to preach. But then he paused. And as it was the beginning of a new academic year in this university town, he decided to explain why this church took having the Bible open on our laps as we listened to the sermon so seriously. It is because, he went on, we believe that as the Bible is explained, God speaks to us. God addresses us in the preaching of his word. It was a remarkable thing to say. And I still remember the moment as if it was yesterday. We felt at home immediately and we thoroughly enjoyed serving alongside God's people in that place for the next three years. But was it true? Is it true? Can such a connection be made between the preaching of the Bible in a church early in the 21st century and God addressing his people. What is this strange practice anyway? Why does the gathering of Christians so regularly center upon an uninterrupted monologue connected with various degrees of success to this ancient text? On what basis might we ever expect this practice to nourish Christian discipleship? Preaching, as Christians have understood it for the past 2,000 years, is the public proclamation of the word of God and its application to the lives of all those who hear. That task carries with it certain assumptions which need to be examined regularly since conviction that this is something still worth doing rests on the truthfulness of those assumptions. Is it true that the Bible is the word of God? And so the public proclamation of the Bible's teaching is, in fact, the public proclamation of the word of God. Is it true that what the Bible has to say is intensely relevant to the lives of men and women in every age, not least in the 21st century? Is it true that public proclamation has a unique role in bringing this word to bear on the lives of people? something that goes beyond private reading or small group discussion or debate? Is there something particularly appropriate about a respected elder encouraging and exhorting God's people on the basis of an advance in their knowledge of God? All of these are good questions, and many of them will be addressed in uh, what I have to say in the next few minutes. I want to begin, however, by asking how the task of preaching is grounded in the person, character, and gracious activity of God, and then reflecting upon how this impacts the way those of us who preach engage in the task. That's because I'm convinced that we need to see preaching as a richly theological activity, not just in terms of its content, ensuring that we're talking about God rather than just about ourselves, but also as an activity. Ultimately, this is something that God is doing. It was Thomas Aquinas who gave the lasting definition of theology as talk about God and about all things in relation to God. Despite its first appearances, he was not in fact inflating the definition of theology to include everything. Theology is not an attempt to say everything about everything. But it does say something very important about everything. That is, that everything is ultimately to be seen in relation to God, since everything exists as part of created reality, and he is the creator. And that is true, of course, of preaching. All preaching occurs within the reality which has been created by the triune God. But that doesn't take us very far, and it doesn't exhort what we mean when we speak about preaching as a theological task. We have to begin with God himself. So firstly, the biblical picture of God as speaker. 
Though the usual categories in which God's person and activity are considered are creator and redeemer, whose work produces the economy of creation and redemption, in recent theological discussion, God's communicative character has been a particular focus of attention. This is not to minimise the importance of these other two reference points in the doctrine of God, but rather an acknowledgement that they are both aspects of the opera ad extra, God's work outside of himself, which is neither necessary nor definitive. God, though creator, would still be God if he had never created. Though redeemer, he would still be who he is if there had been no one to redeem. Creation and redemption do not define him in the way light and life do. Sorry, love and light do. Or the names father and son. There was never a time when God was not father. And there was never a time when the father was without the son. Moreover, as John reminds us, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The communication between the Trinitarian persons, however we are to conceive of it, and we must be very careful not to say too much at this point, is not external action, opera ad extra, but internal relation, relatio ad intra. It is not dependent upon anything outside of the Godhead or created by him. In other words, God has always been a communicator. His word has always been with him. Communication matters to God, we might say, because it's intrinsic to his being. Despite its modern popularity, this is not exactly a novel thought. In 1723, the great American theologian Jonathan Edwards wrote, the great and universal end of God's creating the world was to communicate himself. God is a communicative being. This is not a thought that Edwards develops at any length. His posthumously published dissertation concerning the end for which God created the world did, however, return to the theme, arguing that God's final goal of a glorious and abundant emanation of his infinite fullness of good ad extra arose from a communicative disposition in general or a disposition in the fullness of divinity to flow out and diffuse itself. In both these instances, it's clear that Edwards has in mind a broader understanding of communication that's com than is commonly understood today. The combination of the words communicative disposition and emanation suggests precisely this. God's communication of himself is his self-giving. It is a constituent element of his love. It is not in the first instance mental or verbal discourse. He communicates his own excellency and happiness. Edwards was certainly not suggesting that the creation is necessary or an extension of God's being. Later in the dissertation, he spoke of how God is above all need and all capacity of being added to and advanced, made better or happier in any respect. What he has done, though, is to insist that communicativeness is a proper divine attribute. It is, for it is his essence to incline to communicate himself. Now, this insight has been taken in two slightly different directions by Robert Jensen and Kevin Van Hooser. Jensen, speaking of the being of God, included, as the fourth of his propositions, the one God is a conversation. With a similar reference to John 1, he remarks, the Logos is at once with God and is God. The word is both spoken by and to God and is the God who speaks and hears. According to the doctrine of the Trinity, the Son is both of one being with the Father and the Spirit and is himself the word that the Father speaks and the Spirit enlivens. The Christian eternity is not silence but discourse. One implication he sees of understanding this aspect of God's life is that it challenges certain strands of Christian mysticism. Spiritual progress in the gospel, he writes, does not take place by silence but discourse. Discourse. 
Now, there is, of course, a subtle but a significant difference between speaking of God's communicative disposition and speaking of God himself as a conversation. If this is just a way of saying that mutual self-giving is an eternal and intrinsic characteristic of intra-Trinitarian life, then this is undoubtedly true. The perfection of God's eternal relational being most certainly has this character, and the words of John 1 do provide an important ground for saying this. From eternity, the word was both with God and was God. The living God is not a solitary monad, but in all eternity enjoys a glorious and sufficient fullness of relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, the language of God as conversation leans too much in the direction of an abstraction that neglects the idea that a conversation takes place between two or more persons. The identity of being an action in God, he is as he acts and he acts as he is, does not negate the reality that it is persons who act. Likewise, a conversation requires persons who converse. Jensen's proposition is suggestive, but in the end, unsatisfying. Van Hooser moves in a slightly different direction, helpfully interacting with a range of voices, including especially Catholic philosopher and theologian W. Norris Clark. He writes, unlike creatures, God is the author of his own existence. Moreover, God is constrained by no greater metaphysical principle than himself to be self-communicative. God's being is active in its own distinct way, communicating its goodness, first of all, ad intra. Before God creates and relates to the world, God's being already consists in communicative activity, namely the Father's begetting of the Son and the proceeding of the Spirit. He then goes on to make an important observation before quoting Clark. We only know God as the paradigm personal communicative agent, however, from his triune speaking and acting in the history of salvation. The quote, it is constitutive of the very personality of God as father that he communicates the whole fullness of the divine perfection or nature without remainder to the son. In other words, this is not abstract a metaphysical speculation, but the necessary conclusion from the concrete particulars of how God has acted in the creation, and especially in the person of Jesus Christ. Van Hooser is rightly only prepared to describe the inner life of the triune God to the extent that it can be discerned from the communicative patterns that comprise the economy. God is antecedently in his eternal being what he is consequentially uh, consequently, to us in the Son. As he says, it's on the basis of God's communicative presence and activity in history that we come to understand the communicative perfection in eternity. It is for this reason that Van Hooser goes on to explore the Johannine testimony that God is light, life, and love, linking light to the Word of God, life to the Spirit of God, and love to the fellowship of the Father and the Son in the Spirit that this is not a matter of scattered proof text, but the very texture of all God's dealings with his creatures from the beginning until the consummation is immensely important. It is no accident, nor is it simply a literary device that the Bible opens and closes with God's speaking. It is ultimately reflective of a very important truth about God, that communication of himself his will and his love is not something incidental or transitory in his dealings with human creatures. It flows out of who God is, who he always is. It then becomes no surprise that the writer to the Hebrews can sum up God's dealings with human beings with its clear focus on the people he's chosen for himself as, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. From the beginning to the end of the biblical revelation, God engages the human creatures he has made, and the means by which he does this is human words. This is his speech ad extra, his speech beyond himself into the universe he has made. It is at the same time both natural 
and supernatural. Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Jeremiah, and all the rest experienced the address of God in a way they were immediately able to understand. No translation was needed when Adam walked in the garden, when Abram stared at the sky in Haran, when Moses stood before the bush that burned but did not burn, etc. Nor were the words used so complex that puzzlement and conclusion were the only possible response. This address of human beings by God, using human words, using the same means by which we communicate with each other, is an act of divine condescension, of accommodation. John Calvin made much of this truth in regard to the use of anthropomorphism in scripture. God's accommodation is, in fact, another expression of his gracious, self-giving character. God himself ensured, as he told Isaiah, that the word that goes out from his mouth shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Yet, before we go any further, should we retreat a little and insist that, like all language about God, the Bible's description of God speaking is properly understood as analogical or metaphorical? After all, God does not have the physical equipment we ordinarily associate with human language, lungs, larynx, and lips. Taking that route does not suggest that what we're talking about is unreal, but rather that the words we use to describe a human phenomenon, speaking, are being used as a way of indicating an important truth about something quite different. We'd simply be saying that we shouldn't think of audible sound or a voice. The Swiss reformed theologian Emil Brunner certainly thought this was the case. When God speaks, he wrote, if it is really he who speaks, something is said which is evidently quite different from that which men usually call speaking. Brunner, it must be remembered, uh, was arguing for the con a concept of revelation that distinguished a full personal knowledge uh, from merely propositional knowledge, the self-manifestation of God from mere words about God. However, that's a dichotomy not found in the Bible itself. If God is the origin of the words, then they are the means he has chosen to manifest his character and his purpose. The propositions can themselves be personal. With William Tyndale, we can rightly say, God is but his word. His word cannot be separated from his person. We do not need to see any tension between a true knowledge of God and the actual human words he uses. We do not need to see references to God's speech in scripture as a means of indicating something else. His words are true and powerful beyond anything we experience ourselves, but they are still words and they are meant to be heard. Critically, they are first and foremost his words. It is their source that gives them a distinct character, not their nature. God's speech is the engine room of the biblical story. The writer to the Hebrews understood that critical dynamic. Whether it's the word of blessing and warning in the garden, the word of curse with a seed of its own undoing after the fall, the promise to Abraham, the instruction of Moses, the, the choice of David, God directs the unfolding narrative by speaking to individuals he has chosen. And God, or the Lord, said, is the biblical refrain which finds its fullest expression when the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. This is what marks out the true God from all other claimants. The gods of the nations, their idols of stone and wood, cannot speak. They are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. The true God is a speaker. He speaks to human beings. He speaks in words they can understand. He is not hindered in his self-communication by human sin. He speaks intelligently, intelligibly, sorry, before or after the fall and before or after Babel. More than that, though, God's speaking from the beginning to the end of the Bible 
gives a certain character to relationship with him. When Moses reminded the descendants of Abraham of their meeting with God at Mount Sinai, he insisted, the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. In the Old Testament, God does not give himself to be seen. He gives himself to be heard. Yet even in the New Testament, when the word has become flesh and dwelt among us, when God in the flesh is heard, but also seen with our eyes and looked upon and touched with our hands, still it is the one who hears these words of mine and does them who stands on the day of judgment. The fundamental proper response to God is to hear, a hearing that carries with it both grammatically and theologically the connotation to obey. However, direct, unmediated speech from God is not the only form and indeed not the normal form in which God's word is conveyed to his people. It's not the only form we are called upon to hear. This brings us to the concept of concursus. So secondly, the concursive speech of God. Concursus is the word used to describe the way in which God acts together with and in the creation he has made to fulfil his purposes. Karl Barth calls it the divine accompanying, where not in the might of an autocrat, but in the power of fatherly majesty, God himself, the living God, accompanies the creature doing all things, and yet not doing them without the creature, but working with the creature. The Lord's sovereign direction of all creation, the free execution of his intention by creatures, work together without contradiction. This constant involvement with and in the creation means that he's not limited to acts of intervention in order to accomplish his will. So for instance, when modern medicine affects a cure for disease, it is in accord with the will of God and it is indeed the work of God. God can and does heal directly and miraculously, but he can heal in other ways as well. Interruption is not the only indication that he is um, involved in his world. This has a direct bearing on our subject. In the Old Testament and the New, the speech of God is sometimes heard directly without any kind of mediation. Throughout the Old Testament, God chooses to address particular human beings directly. We've already noted the gathering at Mount Sinai, but we could also cite the experience of Abraham, Joshua, Samuel, Elijah, and many others. Three times in the Gospels, a voice from heaven is heard. At the time of Jesus' baptism, when the Greeks arrive and want to see Jesus, and at the transfiguration. The context in each one of these cases makes clear an audible voice was heard. Yet more often, the word of God is addressed to human beings on the lips of angels or messengers or other human beings. In each of these cases, it's no less the word of God because it is given through an appointed messenger. Perhaps the most explicit biblical reference to concursus in connection with God's word is found in 2 Peter chapter 1. Men spoke from God, verse 21. The reference in context is to prophecy, verse 21. More specifically to the prophetic word, verse 19. And hence all prophecy of scripture, verse 20. The critical condition was that those involved in this phenomenon were carried by the Spirit, verse 21. Since this has been a critical text in discussions about the nature and authority of Scripture, the discussion of it has been extensive. For our purposes, though, these words lead us to consider the phenomenon of prophecy as a particular instance of the concursus of divine and human agency, where the words spoken are no less from God just because men spoke. The first great prophet of the Old Testament was Moses. He was indeed designated as a prophet by God himself in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He provides a paradigm of one human being bringing to another human being the word of God. But he stands alone since God does not communicate with him through visions and dreams, but in the simplicity of transparent fellowship. Intriguingly, the first reference of prophecy in connection with Moses does not actually refer to Moses at all, but to his brother Aaron, 
The Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. It's instructive to go back earlier in the book of Exodus to consider what was involved. In Exodus 3 and 4, Moses, with extraordinary audacity, had repeatedly resisted God's commission to speak his words to the people and later to Pharaoh. In the end, God provides his brother Aaron to speak for him. The Lord tells Moses, You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. In this early case, Aaron was not to deliver his own message, but Moses' message. And Moses' address of the people and of Pharaoh is not at all compromised by the involvement of Aaron. There was not the slightest doubt that this was a confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh, or ultimately between the Lord and Pharaoh, even if it is Aaron who actually does the speaking. In fact, before too long in the narrative, Aaron seems to just fade from view. Later in Moses' ministry, we see the same basic pattern played out. As Moses brings the words God has given him to the redeemed children of Israel, and they are no less the word of God for being heard through the voice and words of Moses. At points, there is a stress on the exact correspondence between the words Moses heard and the words Moses passed on to the rescued people of God. The Ten Commandments are written by the finger of God. That's a standout example of this. At other points, Moses' conscious and active engagement in constructing the message he was to pass on to the people is more evident, most obvious examples being the farewell speeches in Deuteronomy. Yet it is still the word of God he is delivering. The story of Moses demonstrates that God can speak directly to his creatures and indirectly through his creatures. A later and critical prophetic example is that of Jeremiah. As Andrew Sheed puts it, the story that unfolds in the book of Jeremiah demonstrates that the word of God, spoken from frail human lips, indeed written down and revised and rearranged, this word carries all before it in an irreversible tide of destruction and recreation. At the outset of his ministry, Jeremiah was told by the Lord, Whatever I command you, you shall speak. And behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Later in his ministry, Jeremiah dictated to Baruch, the scribe, all the words which the Lord had given him from the days of Josiah until today. The language of dictation reflects a clear concern that it is God's word and not merely human reflection upon that word that is passed on. Yet more is going on than first appears. These were undoubtedly also Jeremiah's words, as he recalled what God had said to him over the course of about 22 years. Jeremiah dictated, but the words he dictated were most likely not verbatim the words he heard in each instance over that period. It was a recollected form of God's words, read aloud, not by Jeremiah or Barak, but in the end by Yehudi, the son of Nethaniah, that confronted Jehoiakim and was rejected so decisively by him. God's word accomplished his purpose as it, would, as it was conveyed by an actively engaged human agent. This idea of concursive speech, as exemplified by the Old Testament prophets, is what Henri Blocher describes as double agency. He points to another example, Habakkuk 2.1. I will take my stand to watch and station myself on the tower and look forth to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk is actively involved. He is looking for the Lord's answer, which the Lord will make known in him and through him. But it will be an answer to Habakkuk's complaint. The prophet gives an answer, and yet it is God who gives the answer. Both are actively involved in addressing God's people through these words, and, to quote Blocher, emphasising God's control and divine origin of prophecy does not deprive the human service of its weight and significance. So the God who is from eternity, communicative in his own being, addresses his creation, and in particular his human creation, with words. 
He may choose to do so directly and without any mediation, the voice from the mountain or the burning yet not burning bush or simply from heaven. Yet he may also choose to do so with the conscious, active and creative involvement of genuine secondary agents. Either way, his address of those he calls to himself is itself always an expression of his character, his gracious self-giving which accommodates itself to human finitude and weakness and interrupts the directions of our distortion and diversion. So thirdly, the, the, the preaching of Jesus. All of this comes together in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. The words which Jesus spoke were the words of God since he is none other than God the Son incarnate. Yet they were also recognisably words spoken by a genuine human being, one of us with lungs, larynx and lips. The miracle of the incarnation, perfect life, atoning death and triumphant resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's supreme act of condescension. It is the ultimate demonstration that God is able to and chooses to work within the world that he has made with all its self-imposed brokenness, corruption and hostility towards its creator. In fact, at the very point at which those things were most intense. Jesus Christ really is Emmanuel, God with us. And this act of self-giving shows us the heart of God. And this is why speaking and words had such an important part of Jesus' earthly ministry. He was faithful in his exercise of compassion his healing and his miracles, his surrender to death and his gift of life, and yet he was as much as anything else a speaker because speaking is the character of the God he came to make known to us. The word-saturated character of Jesus' life and ministry is so obvious that it's easily overlooked. Yet in the light of what we've seen about the communicative character of God, it takes on a new significance. By speaking, Jesus had made known the mind and purpose of God. He brought together the testimony of the Old Testament to God's single eternal plan. He spoke with a power and authority which amazed all who heard him. His word impacted all around him. With a word, he healed the sick, expelled demons, stilled the storm, raised the dead, and critically, forgave sins and offered new life. Even on the cross, he spoke, offering life, expressing faith, and declaring victory. He stood in the midst of the world and he spoke. Just as in the beginning, as the word, he brought the world into being. Edwards's communicative disposition of God was fully realised on earth in the incarnate Son. Jesus himself insisted that the words he spoke were given to him by his Father. By speaking these words, he did his Father's work. In the great high priestly prayer, prayed on the night before he died, Jesus confessed to his Father, I have given them the words that you gave me. And, that they have, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and you have believed, and they have believed that you have sent me. In speaking those words, he was energised by the Spirit. In the synagogue in Nazareth, he claimed the words of Isaiah 61 for himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. His anointing with the Spirit was so that he might proclaim. Whatever else he was to do after that momentous event, he was to preach. It's not surprising then that when his popularity as a healer threatened to swamp everything else, he retreated to a lonely place to pray and when his disciples found him, he announced, let us go on to the next towns that I might preach there also, for that is why I came out. It wasn't the last time he would heal those broken with sickness or free those imprisoned by demons, yet preaching was the priority. This is why he came out, so that he might speak, announce and proclaim. 
so that he might gospel the word that had been given to him. The preaching ministry of Jesus was in this way a Trinitarian work. The power of, in the power of the Spirit, the Son spoke the words his Father had given him. It was not an incidental or secondary aspect of what he came to do. It was an integral part of his saving work and of the way he made known the heart of his Father. God the communicator, giving of himself and speaking life into his creation. In an extraordinary moment in John's Gospel, Jesus asked the 12 disciples whether they, like so many others who'd been with them, wanted to turn back and no longer walk with him. The things he had been saying were not always palatable to everyone. At that point, Simon Peter gave the answer for them all. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, finally, the uh, continuing presence of God among his people. A fuller study than space allows would trace this ministry of the word from Jesus through his apostles and into the generations that succeeded them. Jesus commissioned his disciples to take his message to the ends of the earth until the ends of the age. With that unparalleled authority that had been given to him, the risen Christ called for an age-long program of disciple-making that included baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and passing on all that I have commanded you. The apostles, especially Paul, preached in the early communities the whole counsel of God, the gospel of God concerning his Son, not the word of men, but the word of God. In time, Paul and the others would mentor another generation of Christian leaders who, like Timothy, they urged to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. All this needs to be unfolded and careful distinctions made. We preach, but we are not the spirit-inspired apostles or prophets. We are not the incarnate son. We are not God. What we preach needs to be weighed against what we have been given. The point of this brief sketch, though, has been to go beyond sociological and phenomenological explanations of the durability of preaching in the life of Christian congregations across two millennia to argue that there is a theological reason why the practice continues and why it is right and proper even necessary for it to continue. Preaching is not just a convenient strategy we have adopted to disseminate the Christian message. It is not simply another product of Christian tradition or of our evangelical heritage. Rather, it reflects the character of the word of God, which stands over against us to announce something we would never have imagined, but which changes us forever. Not a point of negotiation, not the initial contribution in a conversation we have freedom to direct as we will, not something we augment or edit because we have a better purchase on reality than those who came before us, but rather a proclamation and a summons. This is what God is like. This is what God has done. It is astonishing in its scope in its righteousness and in its mercy. And you cannot just continue as you were. The kingdom of God has come. It's broken into human history. It is not going away. And its triumph is both inevitable and imminent. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. More than that though, Preaching reflects the character of God. God the communicator who gives himself in completely other-centred love. There is a proper direction to this communication. That is not to say there's no place for response. We hearers do speak in response to what we've heard. In prayer, in praise, in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. But prior to that response... Before it, in every sense, 
is a word spoken and addressed to us. We are called first to adopt the posture of the humble recipient, the hearer who listens with eagerness because we know the character of the one who addresses us in the preaching of his word. He is good and his word is liberating, life-giving, nourishing, and even perhaps especially when it interrupts and challenges the patterns of life and discipleship that we practice in the world. The communicative activity of God, an eternal reality of God's own life and his dealings in time with the world he has made, given definitive expression in the ministry of Jesus, reflected in the mission of the first witnesses to the resurrection and shaping the life of the churches that sprung from that mission, that is the theological anchor of the practice of preaching. In scripture, we see God speaking directly as with Moses and uh, um, indirectly through messengers. Why does God privilege the second across scripture? Uh, perhaps is it in anticipation of the incarnation? I'm tempted just to say yes, um, but I think also it's, it's, uh, it's reflective of God's character uh, shown right throughout the Bible that he, he does not need us but he chooses to work with us. So it's an act of grace that God should use a Moses. And it, it demonstrates God's involvement with the world that he has made. Um, and until that time when Jesus comes and until that time when Jesus returns, the voice we hear, the only voice we can hear is the voice of our neighbor who speaks the word of God to us. So I think it's reflective of God's involvement in the world, but obviously has that centre point in the incarnation uh, as the Old Testament prepares for it and as the New Testament points us back with expectation of his return. The relationship between preaching and prophecy, any thoughts? Um, I think there's another paper on that, isn't there, um, somewhere later on. Um, I have just... For the purposes of this paper... Um, both prophecy and preaching are means by which God presents his word to his people in a way that intersects with their lives. The differences of the nuance between prophecy and preaching, I'll leave to the person who's going to do that paper, but they are both expressions of God's concursive involvement with his creatures, enabling us to share with one another what God has made known to us and to show one another how that intersects with our life, which I take it goes right back to the garden where the words to Adam are meant to be shared with Eve, that they are actually meant to talk to each other about what God has said. Now, the, the precise difference between preaching and prophecy or the degree to which they overlap with one another, which my anticipation is that they do and that they overlap each other at the point of application, which is why prophecy needs to be tested, um, uh, particularly because the application needs to be tested against the word that's been given to see that it is consistent with the word that's been given. That, I think, is going to be developed in another paper. When we preach and perhaps uh, we don't get the passage right, is God still speaking? And is it helpful or right to speak of degrees uh, to which God is perhaps speaking through the preacher? I wouldn't want to go to the second point. So, no, I think to the second point, degrees of God speaking. God uses fallible, weak and um, sinful human beings to declare to one another his word. And we sometimes get things wrong, which is, of course, why we have the word against which to measure the preaching of the word. Uh, but that God could actually use a sermon that is totally off the point to challenge me is still within God's gracious you know, condescension towards his people, uh, that he could actually use a false prophet to further his purposes in challenging the true prophet uh, in when it came to A, Caiaphas, and B, uh, in the Old Testament. So if we agree that God does not need to create, uh, shouldn't we agree that God does not need to speak? I think the difference is that the Son is described as the Word, and so this idea of communication is part of the, in, in, the intra-Trinitarian life. Um, God does not create the spirit, nor does he create the son. Uh, but he does, th there is that communicative self-giving uh, 
that we see in the intra-Trinitarian life, which is why I think uh, speaking is such an integral part of how we understand who God is. So the words that we hear are the expression in the economy of what God is like intra-Trinitarianly. Now, you can say that to some degree about creation too, about his self-giving by creating and his love in redeeming, um, but he does not need creatures to love or to, re- or to create or to redeem in order to be who he is, but com- the communication of the Father, the Son and the Spirit, I take it is integral to his eternal life. Okay. Hebrews 1, in these last days God has spoken to us uh, in Son. How has God spoken to us in his Son more than in uh, what he said and done in Scripture? Um, I think the answer to that question has got to do with Jesus' commissioning of his disciples to take that word to the ends of the world, uh, to the edges of the earth and to the end of the age. So the commissioning of the apostles to be witnesses to the resurrection is God's taking of his word to the world. And I think that is the continuing speaking of the Son, so to speak. The follow-up question is, um, is, is it Jesus being that somehow communicates uh, in addition to or more than just you know what what he he says and does so is it something about the son's being that communicates i don't know how to answer that question um i'm not quite sure i understand the question um that jesus commissions his disciples and says you are my witnesses says they have the stamp of his authority it's interesting the apostle paul writing in his epistles will regularly appeal to the fact that he is an apostle appointed by God through Jesus Christ for this purpose. Um, I don't think I want to go into thinking about Jesus being in that kind of way. I think you do end up with a kind of mysticism that I'm not comfortable with. But let me think about it more because... Uh, we, we might leave it there. Thank you very much, Mark, again. It's a uh, show of appreciation.